Go ahead. Action. Okay. Okay. Um, so anyway, this was uh, Geneva County High School. It was built in 1929 after the first one had burned. I believe the first one was built in 1909. That's when it was established, I think. I'm not sure about my dates. But anyway, um, after it closed, we built the new school. For a long time, this was the middle school. And then when they added on to the new school, they moved the middle school students over there and closed this building. And thankfully, the city bought it and made the community center out of it. Hey, how are you doing? All right. And um, so a couple of our artists, I know Kathy Coffey was one. Oh, yeah, I'm calling Guy was the other one. Did this mural of the town. Uh, this was... This was the original high school of the Geneva County High School. Okay, now Hartford High was the colored school. It's on the other side of town over there. Um, but anyway, this one burned and they built this one in the place of it. I believe, I don't know, from some pictures I have, I believe that one may have been a little bit further that way. I'll show you the pictures later and, and you can decide for yourself. But these are just some main things um, we have around town. The old city hall building. You'll recognize the grain elevator. Um, Dixie Howell was a football player and he actually went to um, Hollywood and starred in some silent movies. I think, it was, I think they were silent. Um, cowboy movies, I think. Um, then uh, Pond Town Methodist Church, I told you about Pond Town and you know where it was across 167. Um, you know about the Rose Theater. We had several dry goods stores. I'll show you a list of all the stores Hartford West had. Um, there were two or three horse and buggy stores um, there's the railroad. The old depot building is still there, but they took up the tracks. The hotel is not there. It was a hotel, then it was a hospital, then it was Dr. Strickland's office for a long time, and then he built him a new office and they tore that one down. Um, First National Bank in 1905, and then they, um, moved to the building that's on the north side of the square that's an insurance building now and moved to that building and then I think they tore that down and built another building in its place and then moved back over there later on. Uh, I, think, I think that's about everything else is pretty self-explanatory. This log cabin snack bar was beyond, it's about over there where those, um, where the Hartford Fire Department and Rescue Squad are now. Um, I can remember, it was still in business when I was little. But go ahead, I'll show you around the museum. <laughs> Of course, cotton was real big. They ended in 1968, I think, 68 or 69. And this was the building when they first integrated. And I don't remember any problems. Everything went very, very smoothly. So I was, I was happy about that. I wasn't here at the time. My family moved in and out of Hartford, and this happened while we were away. But I moved back here in 1969, and everything was going smoothly. Tell me, tell me, tell me. We didn't always have a um, public kindergarten. We had a lady that lived on the street over here, Miss Lee. She ran a private kindergarten, and uh, a lot of us got to go to her kindergarten. And she would always have a program at the end of the year and it would feature some of us singing, 
Some of them skated on roller skates, and um, we always had some little thing. And I can remember um, uh, me and a boy, little boy. He sang the Red Red Robin, kind of ba 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 along, and and. Uh, I don't know what I did, but it was me and him up there. And uh, I had on a long red formal little gown. And I had to come down those stairs over there. And I tripped <laughs> over my gown. <laughs> and our teacher's son, he was probably about the fifth or sixth grade, was standing at the bottom of him. And he caught me <laughs> as I fell down the stairs. <laughs> and you fell in love. And that, no. <laughs> that had to have been. 61 years ago, and I still remember the embarrassment. <laughs> they held the graduation ceremonies in here, and um, every week, um, each grade level, not every week, maybe every month, they, but anyway, each grade level was responsible for a program, called it the chapel program. I don't know why, but anyway, you would have to perform a song and a skit and there would be some theme like maybe October would be Columbus you know or, or some kind of thing and then you would have some kind of a, an assembly in here in the whole school and um, they continued those even when they got over into the new school it was after I had left that I remember um, Barbara Hughes and some of them telling me that one time <laughs> they had the guy come that had done the whistling for the Andy Griffith show <laughs> if you remember the theme song there <laughs> but uh anyway this is um this was the auditorium is this where they had the prom night and all that um i think they probably did the prom in the gym in those days because they had seats they had those old theater style seats i don't know if they were screwed to the floor or not i think they may have been kind of you know the old uh, wooden theater kind of seats or what we're in here. Okay, this first um, room here is probably predominantly about the school. You can see all the different classes. Um, I tried to arrange them from the earliest to the latest, uh, whatever would fit there. This is a cornerstone from the first building that burned. You can see the farms. Everybody picked cotton. Um, my mother picked cotton. Um, she used to tell me about my, she said that the, the plants used to grow taller and they grow shorter now because of the cotton pickers so they can move over them. But in those days, they grew taller, and she said she could hide under the cotton plants and take a little nap every now and then when her daddy wasn't looking. <laughs> and he would yell, come on, gal, get up, let's give it the black eye. <laughs> and she said he could, he could pick three rows at a, ta a time. He would straddle the middle row and pick the ones on either side. <laughs> Both of my granddaddies at one time or another were sharecroppers. They lived on other people's land, and um, eventually they saved up and were able to buy their own land. But everybody worked. You might recognize the girl on the bottom row there. <laughs> the fourth from the right down there. <laughs> you were really young in there, huh? <laughs> 1972, that's a you I also graduated from Miami Senior High School. Yeah. You'll recognize Gail. 
Okay, <laughs> look at Gail, how pretty she was. Well, she's still very pretty. Yeah, and um, let's see, there's Barbara. Ooh, Ooh, Barbara. Look at Barbara. Mm. <laughs> and let's see who else you might still remember. Go to our church. I don't know. Um, a lot of them have moved on. Mm -hmm. So Chuck graduated here? No, he he was um, in um, he was in Wisconsin by the time he graduated. <laughs> But he didn't grow up here. He grew up in, um, well, all over the place. He was born in, um, this is dedicated to Coach Justine. We all loved him so much. He was a wonderful man and a great coach. <laughs> he got a lot of accolades. I don't know if you were here. Were you here when he was still alive? Uh, J.D. Chastain was uh, Gail and Donnie's daddy. Donnie is now one of our state senators. Hmm. Nice. Very nice. And over here, this is kind Mr. of Ranger. There was our principal um, from nineteen. 60, I think, to 1969, most of the time when I was in grade school. And uh, I was terrified of this little, this thing right here. <laughs> he would walk through the halls and it would, he would put it in his back pocket and you could almost see it sticking out over his shoulder. <laughs> I thought that paddle was huge. <laughs> How old were you then? Oh, from first grade to about eighth or ninth grade. And then he later became superintendent, but he was a wonderful man. He um, he was strict. He expected you to obey the rules, but um, you knew he loved you, you know. And um, but he was he was a neat guy. And there's a lot of signatures on that paddle, and they're very proud of him. <laughs> Cannot see because of the glass. The glare, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll put it under there because I was afraid it might walk off. Mm -hmm. And who's this big? I don't know. Sure the story behind that one. Where? Oh, Becky Coffee was uh, Kathy's mother. She lived next door to my grandmother and granddaddy. She was a nurse, um, the sweet, sweet lady. Kathy is the one that did the mural in the hallway out there. Uh, Miss Orr there is Cherry Orr's, um, I'm trying to get this straight, grandmother-in-law, I guess you would say. <laughs> This is just Gail's paddle. In those days, you know, we, we believed in corporal punishment. We never abused a child, but it worked. This is Catherine Goodnight. She's the one that started the museum. Her father was an artist, and I'll show you his artwork in the other room here in a minute. But she, And she worked for the Reaper, and she um, started this museum. Okay. Jesse May Metcalf was a math teacher, and uh, this belonged to her. But uh, she was a wonderful teacher. And what is that? I want to say protractor, but don't quote me. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah, so compass. 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 It was a compass. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And Metcalf and Lottie Lee Brock were sisters. Okay, and in the time. They lived together, Miss Jessie May and Miss Lottie Lee. And they lived not far, about two doors down from where I do now. And they were, they were sweet little old ladies, little old school teachers. And I remember they would come to the other side of town to visit my grandmother sometimes. And, and uh, we would say, oh, we're so glad you came to see us. And they said, well, you know, the doctor said we could drive as long as we didn't cross the highway. <laughs> 
they robbed Miss Jessie May and Miss Lottie Lee. <laughs> this is dedicated to the churches. I tried to put them in order of when they were established. Pond Town is about our oldest one. Um, and uh, that's one of their original buildings. I don't think the original building I know was a log cabin. And they said the, the slats in the floor were so wide apart that you could throw a cat through them. <laughs> so it wasn't very warm in the, in the winter time. And then later on came Shiloh, which was out at Dundee, you know, and then Pond Town, about the same town, same time. Hartford, you know, a lot of, a lot of towns, if you study history, sprang up around railroads or rivers or industry, but Hartford pretty much sprang up because they built the Methodist minister a house, which I think is kind of neat. We sprang up around our churches, our church families. That was Hartford Baptist in the 70s. This is Brother Ralph, he could see. His daughter, Laura. Sorrels, you heard mm -hmm. her sing. <laughs> oh, she is a beautiful singer. Yeah. So she's a Brannon. Yeah. I didn't know Laura was a Brannon. Mm -hmm. And some of these, well, we do have some of Shala. Some of their, some of the stuff I have in my bag because I've been writing the history. And I included a, a lot on the churches too. So I still have some of these in my bag. And these are the, the yearbooks that we have so far. Um, as people get older, they'll tend to donate their old yearbooks or their families will. So we only have them up to so far. That's cotton gin. Him. Curryness. Wow. So <laughs> what year did she graduate? Oh, I can't remember. She's an awesome She's a lady. baby. She, she graduated like yeah, a she early looks 80s, very young. I think. <laughs> She's very young. I don't know. I don't know how they're all related. Bob's daughter, the coach. She just went to um, Tennessee. Go ahead. This was our little police station that was on the square. It was maybe 15 feet by 15 feet. It was little. <laughs> but we were kind of proud that that was all Hartford needed. <laughs> we did have a jail in a building not too far from there, but it wasn't. It was like maybe one cell, two cells. <laughs> Smith and Emmett Eford. They were the best. <laughs> they just they just used common sense, you know. Well, humans should not need police. Yeah. To police them, you know. But unfortunately, we do. We do have a very good police we do. department. Carrie donated that. Stacy's mom had it, and um, I'm not really sure. It's just the montage, I guess, of different members. There's Jennifer's book. Your books for sale. Like a fundraiser. Yeah, I think they help us buy pencils and paper, things like that. Mm -hmm. Frames, anything. Mm -hmm. Now, donations. Tell us about donations. Oh, we accept donations. <laughs> As you can see, uh, some of the class pictures over there need 
frames. Um, there was some damage to them before they were donated to us, so um, we need the frames for those, and they're not cheap. Um, we're running out of room. We can always use more display cases, and um, we finally have a computer and a printer, so we'll be needing ink and paper all along for that. Um, we hope to one day get the Wi-Fi in this building to reach down here on this end. So if people want to come in and do research on maybe um, family histories or Hartford history, um, they could do that and we'll be able to print it all, things like that. I'm not good, I have mic fright. <laughs> just cut out because nobody would look at them because they were just all big stacks of old papers so I went through and I just cut out um, the articles that um, were pertinent to Hartford and then in some cases they just donated the clippings so we didn't have the articles there's an article in my history book that I'm writing about the two girls from Hartford one was working in the Pentagon the day on 9-11 on when it was attacked. And uh, what's her name? Her name is Susan Chandler Foster. Um, is she the one that was at the... No. No, that was... she's. What was her name again? This girl? No, the... Oh, I don't remember her name. But um, anyway, you remember Leonard Chandler? Mm -hmm. it, was it was his daughter. This one is her, his daughter. Susan worked, she was working in the Pentagon and Marsha, her sister, was working a few blocks away. Saw the plane crash into the Pentagon knowing her sister was in there. And it took them two hours to find out that her sister was okay. It was a stressful day. I think it took them longer than that to get the word down here to, um, to Lynn family. and Mary Charles that they were okay. Carl Max Hammond, he's a cousin of a friend of mine, and he was on the second plane to hit the Trade Center. So our little town and our little county, you know, was touched by that. I'm sure thousands of little towns and counties across the country were touched by that. Okay, okay I told you Mr. Clemens donated the land for the Methodist preacher's house. Okay, and Hartford kind of sprang up around there. Originally, they called it Clemens City. But a couple of years later, they wanted to name it something else for some reason, and they asked the post office for recommendations, and it was the post office that recommended they name it Hartford. So that's where we got our name. Go ahead. Okay, I told you about Dixie Howell earlier, the football player. This is early win. He is a baseball player, and he's actually in the Baseball Hall of Fame up in Cooperstown, New York. Chuck and I went up there and found his plaque a few years ago. Um, he is related to Deborah Craig, our Sunday school teacher. He's related to her mother, and he was good friends with our town doctor, Dr. Strickland, Neil's daddy. Mm -hmm. okay. This is Dixie Howell in his later years. Um, he was a football player. He played for the University of Alabama. And uh, there's a picture of him over there, number 60, in his younger years. He's the one that later went to, to uh, Hollywood. <laughs> so, Go ahead. This is a friendship quilt. I want to say it was made around the 1920s, but I may be wrong. But all the ladies who worked on it embroidered their family name on it. So it's kind of neat. Whose Bible is this? Lassiter family. He was uh, one of the uh, first postmaster, or, or no, not first postmaster. He was postmaster in the 1960s, I think.
these eggs. These eggs were made by Linda Kinman. Um, she's passed on now too, but she was, um, I don't know if you know Gary Kinman. She was his wife. And uh, she made these beautiful eggs out of ostrich and emu eggs. And um, she was so good that twice she, um, you know, she made them for Alabama and twice her eggs were sent to Washington to the White House to be on their Easter tree up there to represent Alabama. What were they building? Yeah, don't steal all that now. I'm putting those pictures in my book. That's okay. <laughs> you can write a book too. <laughs> then when you when you write the book, my book's not copyrighted, so anybody no. can steal it if they want to. No, because <laughs> the only thing is that these pictures are going on a video, oh. <laughs> and I'm going on a picture picture. So. Okay. <laughs> and where's this video going? YouTube. It's <laughs> downtown. You know where um, David Schutz's insurance company is? Uh -huh. and you recognize the, uh -huh. the two windows up there? That was our Rose Theater. It used to be down the street near where Ketchum's is. Um, but then they moved it up there. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you about some of these. skating rink and it was run by um, Jan Vineyard's parents um, Barbara Redhorn and it was um, I think they were in conjunction with um, uh, the Hubert Brooks family I forget who all was involved in it but anyway this is these are reds Skate, Jan's daddy skates and her mother's skates. Um, but we all went to the skating rink on the weekends and they were practically brought up there. <laughs> and over here, the, the, the radio station to listen to was Big Bam, WBAM, out of Montgomery. And they, they were the top 40 radio station. And every year, they would have the Big Bam show in Montgomery and they would um, have all these stars come. I always wanted to go and I never got to go. But um, this is just advertising the Big Bam show. It was a really big deal. Tommy James and the Shondells. <laughs> These are some things out of some of the old drug stores. We've had really good ball teams, football teams over the years, basketball teams, state champions. This is our National Guard unit. This is my daddy right here. Um, Bobby Tyndall. 
I'm trying to find a picture. Oh, there's a lot of people on there that you would recognize. Anyway, in 1962, they were mobilized and we all went out to California. That was a big deal for us because we kind of, in those days, people didn't travel. And a lot of us had never been out of the county unless you were connected with the National Guard. Some of us got to go up to Kentucky one time, but um, we went out to Fort Irwin, California. And that was a big deal. We got to go to Disneyland and all this stuff. and. Um, and when we got home, they had a big, it was like Mayberry, they had a big celebration in the square with the high school band and, and speeches and the National Guard marched in, marched in and shook everybody's hand. And you know, you could just see Andy and Barney up there. <laughs> but it was kind of neat, it was, it was a neat thing. But, um, and I don't know exactly what that, if that was in response to the Bay of Pigs or something that was going on at that time, but that's, um, uh, we all got, and we'd never been, we'd never seen a desert. <laughs> we were right out there in the middle of the Mojave Desert. <laughs> so it was an interesting time for us. And a lot of us who, uh, whose fathers were in the guard, that, you know, kind of, um, we were just all one little group out there from Hartford. <laughs> Recognize Howdy Doody there. And um, I don't know how many people had these little chalkboards and blocks, uh, pick up sticks, um, dice, your red wagons. <laughs> I don't know that that desk actually came from Hartford, but that was the kind of desk that we had here. Now, I started school first grade in 1961, and that was the kind of desk we had. Um, and I was in that kind of desk up until the third grade. So I don't know when they changed them out, but um, I, I remember being in those desks up until at least the third grade. So was I. <laughs> in Cuba. And we um, we had a school, um, like I said, this was the high school then. A couple blocks over is where the elementary school was, and across the street there's the old gym. And next to the old gym there was a little building that housed the first grade rooms. And that's where my first grade was. The, the elementary school there was actually built by German POWs during World War II. We had a lot of Germans in the area. They were kept them at Fort Rooker, and they did. Um, they worked in the fields, and they did a lot of work, I guess, for the cities and all that all around. Um, I think they were well treated. I think some of them came back and settled here after the war. Um, but German prisoners of war actually built our elementary school. That's an old Singer machine. It's probably, um, I don't think all the parts are there. It's, it's probably an old pump machine. Um, my grandmother used to sew on that. I can remember her making me clothes on that and she would pump the pedal beneath and uh, she made me pretty little dresses, all kinds of things on that old machine. <laughs> Those kind of quilts were very common. People made them from scraps and um, you know, that's what they had to keep warm in. People didn't have nice comforters and bedspreads and things like we have today. They lived, um, you know, a lot of the people on the farms just lived in little wooden houses, not painted. And um, my grandma, my mother said you could see the dirt through the floor, you know, on the, through the cracks in the floor. And she talked about having to keep the wind out of the walls in the wintertime. It was cold, so, you know, you just wrapped up in what you could find. Grandmother would make her clothes out of flower sacks. Um, you know, you just did what you could. This is from the black school in Hartford, the colored school. And I've only recently gotten information on that school. 
And it made me feel really sad because, um, you know, I'm a, a former teacher and we studied things like Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, the things that led to integration and uh, what it was like during segregation. And I guess it really didn't hit home to me. Um, when I was little and we would get our new little readers like, um, you know, our new little Dick and Jane books that we would read, I would always be so excited to, um, to turn the pages, you know, and smell the new book and just see the new pictures. And then when these people gave me the history of their school, I found out they're getting hand-me-downs and some of the pages are dog-eared and some are torn out and some are stuck together with chewing gum. And it just broke my heart uh, because these people were the people that later on I graduated from high school with because we integrated during the time you know, that I was growing up. And their school, if you'll look, is just a wooden school. It's not nearly nice. Now this, the school that the kids went to here wasn't exactly plush either. They had a, a rinky-dink water fountain, a wooden handmade water fountain here, and they kind of did the same thing there. I think they were using outhouses here. Some people say they were here up to a point but I think we got indoor plumbing here before they did. Um, so it was rough, but um, they still have reunions for their old school. All their classmates still get together. Um, I don't know if it's once a year, but I know this past year they had one. And um, so they're, they're very close and they remember their school and they remember their teachers and uh, they have some fond memories. Was he? He was a little boy. I think he died of cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, this book was written by my stepfather, um, Lieutenant Colonel Rufus Leggett. And um, he never actually lived in Hartford, but, um, but we did, and he was, he was very special to us. But um, he um, was with the unit that um, Field Marshal Gehring, the number two Nazi, surrendered to. And uh, what happened was in the, the 1990s, he went to see the movie Saving Private Ryan. And while he had a lot of respect for the guys that stormed the beaches of Normandy, you know, we, we wouldn't want to ever take away anything from that. But he began to realize after, you know, seeing that movie and hearing people talk that people, a lot of people thought that America's first boots on the ground were there at Normandy. And he said, my guys and I were fighting weeks before that and my friends were dying weeks before Normandy and I don't want people to forget us because he, his, little, his group from Texas started in Africa and they fought their way up Italy um, before Normandy. So he, like he said, I'll never take away from the bravery at Normandy but I don't want people to forget the guys I knew that were dying before that. So he wrote a book and uh, anyway, this is Zell MC, and it's in Austria, and that's where they had arranged to meet Gehring. And uh, <laughs> they had set up a time that Gehring was supposed to come and surrender. And my stepfather was on guard duty the night before. Well, Gehring shows up early, <laughs> and he says, here comes this barrage of Jeeps, and, um, and he's like, He's here. He says, I don't know what to do. <laughs> but he actually saw Gary. He had his own pictures of him and, and everything as he surrendered. So 
anyway, it was kind of neat. But he wrote this book so people wouldn't forget that he had people that he knew that, that were dying and giving their lives there too. Had a Masonic Lodge. We have a book of uh, minutes of meetings from the old Masonic Lodge that used to be here, and they go back to 1901. But stuffed inside this one, I found a letter, and it was written in on May 8th, 1945. And what they would do is they would, um, when someone wanted to join a lodge, they would bring with them letters of recommendation. And this is a letter of recommendation that was sent for a guy who was uh, hoping to join the lodge. And I just want to read to you the last paragraph here. It was written May 8th, 1945. He says, today is BE day, of course. And next to the last step, we hope uh, we'll have to take to get the world told once more that selfish militarism cannot rule the people. Let's hope that it won't be long until Japan will be brought low and forever. I will. I well recall the end of the last war, but I, found, I sound no note of foolish optimism by suggesting that there won't be another war. Let's hope not. But until fellowship in this right spirit and brotherhood is the law of life, we can expect most anything. Okay, um, just the fact that here was the ending of a war. He's pretty sure there'll be other wars, but he hopes not. Just like every time we end a war, we hope there won't be another war. And I thought that's, that's interesting. And it's written on VE Day. Oh, and by the way, just in case you're curious, I have read through all of these minutes of the Masonic Lodge, and there's not one single mention of the Knights Templar treasure, so it's not buried anywhere in Hartford. <laughs> this is uh, from our Boy Scouts. Um, Kenneth Goodnight was the leader for many, many years, and I cannot tell you how many Eagle Scouts he had come out of this troop, but they are quite a Quite a few, and my son was one of them. They went to the Boy Scout Jamboree most every year. These are the, the flags. Um, Stephen will have to show you which one was their flag, but they signed them. Um, but Kenneth was very, he was a very good leader. They call him Fuzzy. So Kenneth was also wow. I know his son was. Kenneth, good night. Oh, good night. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not Kidman. Okay. No, no. And this you will find interesting. This is the Garvin Club. And we have some old, um, we have some old um, scrapbooks. I don't know if they dated them. But they go back a long way. And this is a history oops, of the Garden Club. There was two, I think, to start with in Hartford. And we have um, bunches of their picture albums, their meetings and the, their outings and things they've done over the years. Go ahead. 
this is the pay tribute to our Native American culture. Um, there were lots and lots of Indians in this area, uh, mainly Creek. I have an ancestor who I, I, I strongly believe was Creek. Some, some members of the family think he's Cherokee, but from what I read, I think he was Creek. And um, if you go north of town here, um, there's a little church called Mount Gilead, and there's farmland in between there and the river. But about halfway between Mount Gilead and the river, there are Indian mounds that are some of the oldest in this area, and they've never been excavated. But there were lots of Indians in this area. There, were, uh, there was a terrible massacre down around Geneva at one point. Um, and you know, they were fighting for their land and their way of life. Who's to say, you know, we wouldn't do the same thing. Um, it was sad, it, you know, it's just sad on both sides. But um, anyway, we remember our Indian heritage. Anyway, we would love to have you come visit us up here at the museum. Um, I usually try to be here on Tuesday mornings between 9 and 11, but um, our phone numbers are posted on Facebook. We open up anytime you have an activity here, like if you have a family reunion or anything going on in town, you want us to come up and open up the museum, we can come up and open it for your group. So just either call me or call uh, Gloria Grady down at the community center or Lamar Jackson. And like I said, those, those phone numbers are all posted on our Facebook page. Um, but get in touch with one of us and we'll come up and we'll open it up for you if we can at any time. So we, we would love to have you.